Hi, I'm here with Dr. Sokolo, who is very passionate about the environment. Thank you so much for joining us and for letting me interview you today. It's my pleasure. I would really like to know what you feel the biggest problems are facing our world today. The perception that doing things right costs money. The reality is over the long run, it's cheaper, both from a societal standpoint and from an individual company standpoint. Getting rid of toxic and hazardous waste is expensive. It stays with us for a long time. If there's a way to recycle or to reuse or somehow modify the, the material so that it can be used in other ways, we've saved a great deal of money. We've learned that landfilling isn't the only answer. In fact, it's probably the worst response. If there's a way to be able to recycle things, it winds up being cheaper for the companies, as well as the liability goes down. So it's a perception, I think, a mindset that we have that uh, doing things environmentally may be really kind of fun for the college student, but from a cor corporate standpoint, it's something that is a um, recently, uh, it's not something that we've learned how to do easily. We think that it's an appendage, that it's something ex uh, an external matter. It really is quite, should, should be part of something that we do from a, uh, an economic standpoint. And I don't think that lesson has been learned. You have a pretty fascinating background. Would you mind sharing that background with us? I used to be a professor of environmental science and engineering at UCLA in a program which was multidisciplinary, which was the first program of its kind in the world, started by Dr. Willard Libby, who won the Nobel Prize for Carbon-14 Dating. And it was a perception that environmental stuff wasn't things you had to write a PhD thesis about, but it was something that had to be employed and actually had to be utilized. If all we did was doing research and it got put into a, uh, a volume on the wall, then we've lost. The idea was to try and figure out how you had an environmentalist who was the equivalent of the general practitioner in medicine, but in the environmental arena. How do you take all the synergy of all the issues? Um, for example, as an undergraduate and graduate student, I took classes in law, urban planning, geology, embryology, uh, public health, and I was like, why are you taking all that? And it was like, when I did, it was great cocktail conversation. It only took a, it took a while for it to be recognized that you had to have a synergistic view a view from 60,000 feet to some, sometimes solve environmental problems. That wasn't so simple. Nobody had the background to do that, and that's where I began. What exactly does your company do? We deal with toxic and hazardous waste. Um, we, we deal with how do you eliminate it, how do you avoid it. We usually get the call at a minute to midnight when it's go, oh my God, now what do I do? How do we clean it up? What's the most effect, effective way of dealing with that? Now there's a recognition of life cycle costs. So that if you have a product, what do you deal with it when you make it and what happens when you're done with it? Are there alternatives that are safer, that are perhaps more generic, that would be less costly for the environment and less hazardous for the user? That's something that I'm involved in. We deal with issues of sustainability. How do you deal with products so that you can wind up making it more useful for the environment without destroying its utility? It doesn't necessarily mean it has to be more expensive, maybe a little more exotic, but it might be a little more utilitarian. And it takes a little bit more effort to get to those points. But over the long run, we're much better off in store, instead of storing large quantities of materials that we can't utilize and are eventually hazardous for our groundwater and having to breathe it. If you could give one very sound piece of advice for the average Joe at home, what they could do to make a difference, what would that be? Change out your incandescent bulb and use complex fluorescence. 99, 95% of the electricity used in a normal bulb produces heat. Less than 5% of it produces light. You're, you're using an enormous amount of electricity. If there are ways of simply changing out the light bulbs, that makes an enormous uh, change as well as it's going to be very much cost effective. You'll find it to your bottom line very quickly. Uh, that's probably the best and the simplest way I could think of. You seem to have come across a lot of people and given a lot of great advice and information and insight. You have one quote that you could share with us that is meaningful to you that you believe and would like to share with others. The one thought that I'd always used with students was that life is sometimes like music. The silences are as important as the notes. Sometimes you have to sit back and reflect. Uh, it's easy to give an off-the-cuff response, 
uh, it's not so easy to think about things. And sometimes the most utilitarian, the most um, clear paths take some time. And that's okay. We'll be here for a while. There's a documentary coming out called The Big Fix, and it's just devastating what I've learned about the cover-ups and, and where the oil has actually gone. Can you give me a little more insight on that? There are lots of alternatives to oil. We just decide not to use them for uh, political reasons. Uh, there are ways of getting, there are, and there are simple ways of doing things that we're not using. For example, the city of LA should have solar power on every roof. It would save oil, and it, the multiplier effect of that dollar stays in the United States. It doesn't go overseas. So there are lots of advantages, but there are lots of pressures for continually using oil, which we import. But the devastation is extraordinary. Dr. Soko, thank you so much for being here and for giving me this opportunity. You have given me so much to think about. I really appreciate it. Good. It's my pleasure.